Keep in mind that these are models that are used to explain how nature operates on the microscopic level based on experiences in the macroscopic observable world. They are created by observing properties of nature, and our bonding models provide a framework to systematize chemical behavior. So our molecules we're going to view as collections of common fundamental properties. Right? Our model does not equal reality. Right? Models only take you so far. All models are going to have inherent limitations. They're going to be oversimplifications, and they can often be wrong. They're going to be, every model is going to be wrong in some way. Models become more complicated and are modified as they age. So you might find you reach a, a point where it's like, well, this model doesn't describe this very well. You then modify the model. You refine it. That's the scientific method in action. Underlying assumptions of the model must be properly understood. And more is learned when the model is wrong sometimes than when it is right. right? So you get advances in quantum mechanics when your classical theory of how heating substances up leads you to an ultraviolet catastrophe that predicts at 5,000 degrees Kelvin that you'll get an infinite number of ultraviolet photons out of a black body radiator. Right? And then Planck comes along and says, no, 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 no. our energy's got to be quantized for this. Right? So we can establish the sensitivity of bonds to the molecular environment. Uh, the environment that those molecules exist in is going to be relative to, uh, is going to change those bonds, energies. So sticking a hydrogen onto a carbon to form a single carbon hydrogen bond is going to depend on whether you're working with a CH2 or a CH3 uh, or, or, or you're going to form a CH4. So depending on where you're at, you know, going from carbon and just forming that first one is different than trying to form the other one. It's going to take a little bit different energy. They're all going to be close in the ballpark to each other, though. Um, another example we can look at um, the measured carbon to hydrogen bond energy, whether you're looking at something where you've got a bromine or a chlorine or a fluorine on it. So this bromine is going to pull electrons uh, towards itself differently than the fluorine will. So if I've got fluorine, which is very electronegative, a, a lot of that electron density is going to be centered around the fluorine. Now here comes along this positive looking hydrogen. It's going to be a little bit more energetically favorable to stick it on there because that hydrogen's like, hey, I want to jump onto that a little bit more electropositive carbon and then this a little bit less electropositive carbon for the bromine. And so the takeaway from this is that I'm not going to expect you to know these trends. It's just that that local environment can shift that bond energy a little bit. And we are not limited just to single bonds. Right? A single bond is where you share one pair of electrons, but you can have what are called higher order bonds, right? a double bond or a triple bond where you're sharing two or three pairs of electrons. I think there are compounds that have somewhere so the highest order bond you can actually have is a sextuple ordered bond, and that's going to be formed between some tungsten oxides, some, some WO bonds, where you're going to have like six bonds between a tungsten and an oxygen. Uh, most of them that we're going to see are going to be single bonds with some double bonds, and then the occasional triple bond, at least in Chem 120 and 130. Uh, different bonds are going to have different energies associated with them. So those bond energies are the energy it takes to... Uh, break a bond or the energy that would be released when that bond forms. So a hydrogen-hydrogen bond would take 432 kilojoules per mole to break, or if I've got a hydrogen-hydrogen floating around and I form a bond, it would release 432 kilojoules per mole. Uh, if I look at my higher order bonds, so a carbon-carbon single bond is 347 kilojoules per mole. A double bond is 640. 14, and a triple bond is 836. So more bond order, more energy. But it's not going to like double or triple as you go through. The amount of extra energy is going to decrease as you increase your bond order. Um, and you can see that same trend with your nitrogens uh, and your, your, your carbon higher order bonds, your carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen higher order bonds. Our bond energies can be used to calculate approximate values for reactions. So if I've got H2 gas and fluorine gas, and I'm going to form two H2Fs, and the reaction above, two hydrogen fluoride bonds are formed by breaking one hydrogen-hydrogen bond and one fluorine-fluorine bond. 
the bonds can be broken when positive energy is added into the system. And when you form a bond, it's going to release energy. So there's an equation, real simple, that says our change in energy is just going to be the sum of the bond energies broken minus the sum of the bond energies formed. So energy required minus the amount of energy released. So this is the sum of the terms. D is the bond association energy. It's always going to be positive. And N is going to be the number of moles of a particular bond. All right, so our bond lengths are going to vary with the bond order as well. So the more bondage you've got, the shorter it is and the closer it is together. So a single carbon-carbon bond is going to be 154 picometers, but a triple bond is going to be 120 picometers. Right? So our bond dissociation energy goes up. Our distance decreases the higher the order that we go. So let's compare some physical properties of an ionic compound and one that is a polar covalent compound. The formula mass for sodium chloride and hydrochloric acid, HCl, are pretty close to each other, but they've got vastly different physical properties. So our physical appearance of sodium chloride is as a white solid. Chlorine, hydrochloric acid is going to exist as a gas at room temperature. That's because our ionic bonds generally tend to have higher melting points than our covalent compounds do. If you think about throwing sugar onto a stove, eventually it'll melt and caramelize. That's a covalent compound. Sodium chloride, right, you, you can crank that stove up really high and you're not gonna melt the salt. Our melting point for sodium chloride is gonna be 801 degrees Celsius, whereas for HCl, it's only minus 115 degrees Celsius. Our boiling point is even higher, 1465 degrees Celsius versus minus 84 degrees Celsius. So its boiling point is below room temperature, it will exist as gas. We can use the bond energies on our table to calculate the entropy, or entropy enthalpy change or energy change between methane and chlorine and fluorine to form freon CF2Cl2. So what we will do is we've got our chemical equation here. We've got our methane and chlorine and fluorine, and we're going to form CF2Cl2 and HF and H2Cl. So the idea is to break the bonds in the gaseous reactants to give individual atoms and then assemble these atoms into gaseous products by forming new bonds. So we're going to take our reactants, we're going to throw some energy into it to get individual atoms. And then from our individual atoms, we're going to reassemble some new products and release energy. The energy changes are combined to calculate our overall energy change. So it's going to be the overall energy change is the energy required to break the bonds minus the energy released from the bonds form. This minus sign gives the correct sign to, to the energy in terms of an exothermic process. So we're going to break our reactant bonds. We're going to take our Carbon and our hydrogen, we got four of those. We had four moles worth of carbon-hydrogen bonds. So four moles times 413 kilojoules per mole gives us 1,652 kilojoules. We're going to take two chlorines. We've got two moles of CLCL bonds. So two moles times 293 kilojoules per mole gives us 478 kilojoules. We've got two fluorines, so we're going to uh, two F2s, we're going to take two moles of fluorine bonds and break them. So we'll get two moles times 154 kilojoules per mole, 308. So our total energy required to break them, all those bonds, is going to be 2,438 kilojoules. When we form our products, we're going to form CF2, Cl2. Uh, and those are all going to be bound to that central carbon. So we get two moles of carbon fluoride, so two moles times 485 is 970 kilojoules per mole, and we're going to get two moles of carbon chlorine bonds, so two moles times 339 kilojoules gives us 678. We've got HFs, so we're going to do two moles of HFs bonds, so two times 565 to give us 1,130 kilojoules per mole, and our HCl, we're going to form two moles of H and CL bonds, so 2 times 427 to give us 854. So we get 3,632 kilojoules is the energy that is released. All we've got to then do is combine them. So we'll take our 240-38 kilojoules bonds broken, and we're going to subtract 
3,632 kilojoules bonds formed, and we end up with minus 1,194 kilojoules. It's a very exothermic process. The sign of the value of the energy changes negative. That means that we've got an overall release of energy. Does it always have to be a negative release? No, it can be a positive change. So you might end up with a positive sign. It might take more energy to break the bonds than you get from releasing them. Uh, and in Chem 130, we'll talk about endothermic versus exothermic reactions.